Hello everyone, this is Ashwini. Welcome to Go Campus. At Go Campus, we assist and help doctors to pursue their medical post graduation in India, the United Kingdom, and Australia. Today, I'll be walking you through the standard Australian pathway for medical post graduation and giving you a glimpse of how our AMC MCQ CAT training classes look like. So, first, let's start with the pathway. Here's an easy to understand flowchart for you, which you can see on your screen. Now, first thing to do in AMC is to set up your AMC portfolio, that is your ECFMG. Once you're done with that, you can book your AMC MCQ CAT exam. That's part one of AMC exam. After you pass your AMC part one exam, you can give your OET, IELTS or PTE exam. Once you get the eligible scores, you can apply for jobs in Australia under limited registration. Or the second option that you will have is after you finish your AMC MCQ CAT exam, you can give your second part of AMC exam, that is AMC clinical. So you can apply for jobs with AMC CAT MCQ, English test and AMC clinical. So when you apply for jobs with both the exams, then you can apply for jobs in Australia under provisional registration. So these are the two options that you have. Let's say you got a job in Australia with just part one of the exam. Then you have a choice. After you go to Australia, either you can do your WEA or clinical. And after you complete all your exam, you will get your general registration. So once you receive your general registration, you are eligible to apply for your training post, that is post-graduation, that is your PGY year. So this is about AMC Standard Pathway Program. AMC is a two-part exam, part one, part two. You can apply for jobs with just AMC part one as well. If you want to increase your chances to get a job, it's better you do your AMC part one, part two, and then apply for jobs. So this is the summary about the pathway. Now I'm going to discuss about our training classes. So now let me introduce our AMC MCQ training tutors. Dr. KP Balan is the course director and we have other five to six esteemed tutors exclusively for AMC part one. All AMC classes are conducted online. And here's a brief clip showing about how our classes look like. So this could be an interactive session because I like interactive sessions and I and I will be picking on people to answer because it's very important. Um, BBGs and ECGs do come in your exam. They come in your clinical exam as well. They come in your MCQ exam. You have at least BBGs, you have at least two to three ECGs. You can have a couple in medicine as well, especially the program tends to see, hey, you're doing better in cardiology or you're doing well in cardiology. They might tend to give you more cardiology questions. Then you might get more ECGs. Okay, so it's very important that um, we have ECGs down pack and BBGs. How many of you guys are very confident in ECGs and BBGs? Let's turn on the cameras. Let's see everyone. So I'm not talking to a blind wall. Let's turn on some cameras. Arvind, Namrata, Andrea, Nafisa, Prabhaka, Lohita. Let's see some cameras. Is a dinophagia a uh, contraindication? No. no. Just, they put small blood vessels there. It's only large mm. blood vessels or aorta. And more than 10 centimeters. So it's not more than five. And clear cut, this is the answer for you. Answer. Got it? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Clear? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. No, good. It's a very good try. Thank you. Now, who do we have next? George, this is for you. Which of the following is the important diagnostic feature of achalasia? Dysphagia for solids, dysphagia for liquids, dysphagia for solids and liquids, regurgitation and weight loss. Uh, C, dysphagia for solids and liquids. Very good. How did you get to that? Uh, yeah, but I've, I've read about Ecclesia where uh, you have very good. Is, yeah, so, do you, yeah. you know, you are right, you're absolutely right. But do you know where you see dysphagia for just solids or just liquids? Um, I think just for solids is in uh, esophageal cancer, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, liquids, I don't know, GERD. Uh, all right, no worries. You yeah. have gotten it. I will get to that. So 
What is achalasia? Basically, progressive degeneration of the ganglion cells in the myentric plexus in the esophageal wall, which leads to failure of the relaxation of the lower esophageal junction, accompanied by loss of peristalsis in the distal esophagus. So it's not going to let it go in. And this is going to be your, this is your normal esophagus. This is your achalasia esophagus. So there's going to be a dilatation here and an arrowing over here. Got it? Now, this is what I meant. Guys, take a screenshot of this if you want, because it's pretty important with respect to AMC, MCQ. Always remember, solids and liquids occurs in achalasia. Just liquids will be seen in motility disorders, and solids, like George said, is seen in malignancies. So the next, another we have another one condition. A eight-year-old boy is brought to a practice by his mother who is concerned about a patch of hair loss on his head. According to the mother, hair fall started two weeks ago and left the area bald. An examination that is 2 into 3 centimeter patch of hair loss on the scalp. There is no scarring, inflammation or flaking of the area. There is no scarring, inflammation or flaking of the area. The region is completely bald with no hair. Which one of the following is most likely diagnosis? Psoriasis, tinea capitis, alopecia areata, trichotillomania, and discard lupus erythematosus. Arvind, can you try this question, please? Yes, doctor. Yes. So it is, uh, they mentioned uh, no scarring, so it could not be discard lupus erythematosus. Yes. No. What about the other options? I think it what is. What about psoriasis? In, in psoriasis, also, there should be a scaly plaques and a Yes, shiny silvery scaly plaques are usually seen. What about tinea? In tinea. That should be dermatitis. Yes, there will be inflammation, and uh, even though central clearing is seen, there is some flaking is seen, right? But there yeah. is no flaking here. And what about trichotillomania? That's a pulling disorder. So nothing mentioned in the question like that. Okay. Hair of different length is seen. Okay. Okay. And uh, it's usually uh, the history is it history goes longer. Here it is only for very short duration of two weeks. That's not Okay. Yeah. Yes, so, what what uh, what is the answer for this question from the given options? I think it may be alopecia area too. Okay. Uh, do you know anything about that? Few points about the alopecia area. Too. You can you can try. If you don't know, no problem with that. We can go and see the slide next slide, and we can get the idea about that. No, no, I. I... I couldn't say that. Okay. Aditya, can you go to the next slide, please? So, alopecia areata, it's a sudden onset patchy hair loss. No hair growth and a normal appearing scalp favors alopecia areata as the most likely diagnosis. As in this patient, it's a sudden onset only for the past two weeks. But in other conditions, there will be inflammatory uh, symptoms. And in case of... Uh, Trichotillomania, there is, uh, the duration is usually longer. Here, the duration is shorter. It's an autoimmune condition. It's a term used for hair disorder characterized by one or more discrete area of hair loss. Although hair loss can occur anywhere in the body, it is hair loss of the scalp, eyebrow, and beard that often brings the patient to the medical attention. Okay. Male child brought to the ED with irritability and facial puffiness. He has been passing small amounts of urine. On examination, blood pressure is 160 bar 90. And periorbital edema is noted. Um, urine examination showing proteinuria and hematuria. The child has been treated with topical antibiotics for impetigo three weeks ago. What is the most appropriate management? 
uh, high protein, low salt, low carb, and decrease water intake, or give him IV fluids, start antihypertensives, IV steroids, or low protein, low salt, and increase water intake. Uh, I mean, this, uh, this uh, sounds like a nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic? Uh, Is it nephrotic? Sorry. Or? Mm-hmm. What are the features of nephrotic and what are the features of nephrotic? Mm-hmm. Uh, ma'am, uh, nephrotic, there will be a uh, uh, general, uh, generalized uh, edema and uh, proteinuria. Um, yes. Yeah. But they won't be, there will be uh, minimal hematuria, like uh, in this there's hematuria, so. Yeah, you're right. So nephrotic, they won't have hematuria. They'll have this nephrotic range proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia, and edema. But in nephritic, uh, which is an inflammation, they'll have this hematuria, edema, hypertension, proteinuria, and oliguria. Okay, so this kid has hematuria, right? And uh, high blood pressure. EP size. Yeah, but not in the nephrotic range. Uh, doesn't mention that. And in addition, there is one another clinical feature which points to nephritis. Um, uh, impet- yeah, impet- yeah, there is an impetigo infection a few weeks back. Yeah, with its hemolytic uh, streptococcal infection. You're right. So... Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I think it, it would be appropriate to give uh, option one. Okay. Um, start with option one. Mm-hmm. High protein, okay. low salt, low carb, okay. and decrease water intake. Okay. If we give um high protein, do you think the kidneys will be able to handle the high protein? Like break it down. Um, and no, ma'am. The kidney is already damaged. Already damaged, yeah. It's yeah. Just, no, it's just... So, do you think option two would be an answer? IV fluids? No, it, it will, it's the same, same problem. Uh, mm-hmm. It will be difficult to uh, get rid of the excess uh, fluid. and. Yeah, all, and also, oh yeah, you're right. And he's already got a lot of periorbital edema. Oh, it's, uh, edema, yes, ma'am. Uh, and then I think option four. Steroids. Where do we give steroids? Nephrotic. No, we give it steroids. Okay. Nephrotic. And what about option five? Option five has also got increased water intake. Increased water intake. Yes. So the answer will be? Option uh, three. Okay. So we give antihypertensives. Yeah, you're right. What cases do you look for QT interval or QT prolongation? Yes, Mohan. Uh, okay. In case of uh, amitriptyline overdose. In, in case of what, sorry? Amitriptyline overdose. Uh, Good. Sorry, in yeah. case of TCA overdose, yes. Yeah. TCA overdose. Good. Very good. What other drugs cause QT prolongation? What are the drugs? Antihistamines, okay? Antihistamines, antihistamine overdose also causes QT prolongation, okay? So there's these other drugs that you have to know that cause QT prolongation, yes? So your two most common overdoses are antihistamine overdose because they're over the counter, and two is the TCA because everyone's an antidepressant. Certain antidepressants are more cardiospecific, like amitriptyline overdose, as opposed to other TCAs. Is that clear? As you can see, the classes are interactive and engaging. So basically, our course is made up of, it's a three-month interactive live classes. You get study materials, subscriptions. We also have exclusive two-day recall sessions. And you also have a trial exam score discussion. Plus, you will have a personalized WhatsApp group for every branch where tutors are always accessible to answer your doubts. Plus, you will have a study partner, study group. Basically, everything you need
to prepare for your AMC under one roof. So now, due to popular demand, we've opened registrations for our upcoming AMC MCQ training batch starting in August 2024. Seats are limited because every batch, as most of you know by now, we only take 50 students to ensure we can focus on mentoring each doctor and provide expert quality teaching. Now, to register for the upcoming batch, please fill out the form in the video description so we will be in touch. Thank you so much for watching this video. All the very best. Thank you.